the hedge around you. If you have been very, very conversant with the ministrations for quite some week, I told you that we're on a journey. And I believe that by the grace of God, we end well on this journey of life in Jesus' name. We've been looking at the Christian life. We've been looking at the Christian maturity. We've been looking at Christian growth. We've seen the essence of salvation. We've seen the necessity for holiness and righteousness in life. And many other things. Today, we want to look at this particular thing. That is a big question in the life of many believers. A big question in many churches. A big question to many unbelievers as well. I said unbelievers because the unbelievers expect to see some things unique and special in the lives of the believers. When they don't see those things, they question why. This is what I'm talking about. As a child of God, under the protection of God, there are certain things that ordinarily, normally, are not supposed to be happening to God's children. But those things, we see them happening. And we question why. We see some sicknesses and infirmities. We see some challenges that, even among the unbelievers. And we question why. And many a times, we see some people who are supposed to believe in a Christian life. But unfortunately, their life is completely and totally different. Some began the Christian race. But before you know it, it's a different thing altogether. After the message today, our situations will change. Our stories will change. I'm talking about the hedge around you. When I talk about the hedge, look at the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 8. The Bible says, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Many a times we look at the breaker of the hedge as being the devil. But when you look at the scripture very well, you will come to understand that the devil has a very, very small role to play. Very, very minimal role to play. You have more role to play in either the protection of the hedge or the breaking of the hedge. The hedge over your life will not be broken. What is an hedge? I know some are wondering, what's he talking about? What is an hedge? An hedge is a protective covering against attack from an adversary. Protective covering against attack from an enemy. Protective covering against any evil that might want to come against you. When we talk about hedge, we are talking about a wall. And the wall comes in different and diverse ways. But I'm limiting this to the wall of fire that God builds around the saints. When we're talking about the hedge, we're talking about the shield of protection. We're talking about the armor that the Lord prepares and provides for you. We're talking about a defense and a safeguard to prevent any evil or calamity from befalling you. Now, here in the country, when you see some houses being built very close to a commercial area or to highway, 
there is something that is always being done. It's either a wall is built to fence off the residential properties from the highway or some trees are planted. You may not understand. You go on some roads and then you see some trees planted and you're thinking, oh, these are forests. No, behind them are houses, residential places. Those trees or walls serves as buffer to minimize the effect of noise that we get into those residential areas. Now, come back to hedge. The hedge we're talking about serves as buffer, as a demarcation, as a separation or a protection from the noise of the enemy, the pestilences of the enemy. The law will protect you. Now, you look at an hedge also as a canopy, an umbrella of the living God. You look at an hedge as the divine, divine um, uh, stronghold where you can hide. And I will talk more about that momentarily. The hedge surrounds and protects the children of God from satanic attack, from demonic attack, from evil attack or oppression, and from human invasion on every side. That is, on top of you, there is covering. I need an amen. amen. All around you, there are coverings. In such a way that no matter from where the enemy is coming, they cannot get to you. The enemy will not get to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This hedge we're talking about makes every believer become untouchable by enemy at any time. Turn to someone and say, you are untouchable. You are unkillable. You are undestroyable in the name of Jesus. Now, having said that, turn with me to the book of Psalm 91. This is exactly what the psalmist was talking about in that book of Psalm 91. When he said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Understand now, the hedge we're talking about. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under, under the covering, under the protection, under the shadow of the Almighty. And then he said, I will say of the Lord, I will talk about my God and my King. He is my refuge and fortress. He is my stronghold. He is my fortification. He is my refuge and fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely, somebody says surely. He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence. That's what I was talking about. The buffer. The buffer. The noisome pestilence. That comes to people, you will be delivered from it in Jesus' name. Verse 4 says, he shall cover thee with his feathers. And underneath his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. I don't want to rush through this too much. Because it says, On, he shall cover thee with his feathers. And underneath his wings shall thou trust. Trust. That means under the wings of the Lord, there is safety. Under the wings of the Lord, there is protection. Under the wings of the Lord, there is peace. Under the wings of the Lord, there is power. Now, come back home. When you look at the hen that rears the chicks, and then as the hen will be going about with the children, the chicks, having fun and looking for food and going around. There is a bird that is called, what's the name? The hawk. When hawk, hawk sees the hen and the chicks on the floor, the, hen, the, the hawk dives down to come and do what? To pick the chick, to kill the chick. To destroy the cheek, your life will not be destroyed. 
your family will not be destroyed. And so, as soon as the chicks, the chicks have been trained that any time you see the hawk do this, I flip up my wings, come under it, I cover you. The hawk cannot get me. For as long as you are under my covering. And so, when you as a believer, you are under the covering of the Lord, you are secured. Your life is secured in the name of Jesus. I look at that verse 4 again. He said, he shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shall thou trust. His trust shall be thy shield and buckler. When the hawk sees that the chicks have gone under the wings of their mother, the hawk becomes disappointed. I declare in the name of the Lord, your enemies will be disappointed. Yeah. Verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid. Somebody means that. Thou shalt not be afraid. For the terror by night. Not for the arrow that flies by day. I told you that the hedge we're talking about is a shield from the Lord. It's invisible. You can see it. But pay attention here. The forces of darkness, the powers of darkness, they can see. And that is why they always wait. For a time that that shield will be taken away. But nothing will take it away. And so, when the arrows of the enemy are coming, divine shield comes to intercept them. The arrow hits the shield and never touch you. The arrow of the enemy will not get to you. In the name of Jesus. It says, not for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. A lot of things happen in the dark. The people of the night walk in the dark. Principalities and powers, of course, they walk in the day. They walk also at night. When you are sleeping, not everybody is sleeping. A lot of people are not sleeping. But the Lord will watch over you. It says, not for the destruction that wasted at noonday. The destruction that wasted at noon, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. If just in case you are too tired to say amen for yourself, please receive strength and grace and say the amen for me. I said a thousand shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. It will not come near your family. It will not come near your household. Only with thy eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Why? Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, my protection, my power, my stronghold, my fortress. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he, the God of heaven, shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands. Lest thou dash thy foot against a stone, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me. God has set his love upon you. Therefore will he deliver you. I will set him on high. Because he has known my name. Somebody here because of the name of the Lord is going up higher. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Verse 16, everybody, if you are there, one, two, go. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. A big amen. amen. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. When you have this hedge over your life, 
as a child of God. This is what salvation does. This is what holiness does. Holiness puts us under the protective power of the Most High God. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 2 verse 5 says, For I, see the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. A wall of fire round about. A wall of fire round about. In the name of Jesus. He said, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. Amen. The book of Psalm 34, verse 7. And the angel, the angel of the Lord, encamped round about them that fear him and delivered them. When the enemy is coming for you, he delivers you. When the attack of the wicked is coming, he delivers you. Come back to Zechariah again. That's chapter 2. And then look at verse 8. Verses 8 to 10. For thus says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. Pay attention here. And look up. When you hear the Lord of hosts, what does that tell you? What does, what does that imply? That means there is a host of the Lord. The army of the Lord. That fights on your behalf. And the Lord is the one in charge of them. And here the Bible is saying, For thus says the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. The nations which spoil you. No matter what that nation may be, put their name there. That nation may be an infirmity, the nation of infirmity. That nation may be a nation of oppression, a nation of affliction, a, nature, a nation of failure, a nation of whatsoever it may be. And the Lord is saying, they have spoiled you. They have limited you. They have destroyed your future. But the Lord is saying, the table is about to be turned around. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. For he that touches you, touches the apple of his eyes. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them. And they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that I, the Lord of hosts, have sent me. Sing and rejoice. That is for somebody here. O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. The hedge around you. The hedge around you. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not. And the Lord is saying to somebody here today, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He said, I am thy shield. I told you, the hedge represents a shield. A shield. When any arrow is coming, when any that of the wicked is coming, when any missile is coming, the Lord stands in front of you. The Lord stands all around you, and then you don't know what is going on. Do you know why you are still alive today? It's because the Lord is watching over you. Amen? Amen. Now, listen to this. Every human being is a target of the devil. Every family is a target of the devil. Every business is a target of the devil. But pay attention here. When you are a child of God, there is nothing for you to fear. That you are holy, pure, and righteous does not mean the enemy will not try you. But one thing is definite, if you are in the will of the Lord, is victory. You will prevail. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Job, chapter 1. Job, chapter 1. And then we look at it from... Verse 1. But before you get to verse 1, let's go quickly to verse 10. And then see something there very, very quickly. Job, what chapter? 
chapter 1, what verse? Verse 10. Verse 10 is the one we are looking at. For. Has not thou made an hedge about him? Has thou not made an hedge about him? Now, who is speaking here? This is the devil speaking. And the devil is speaking the truth. Which many believers does not know about. That even though you are a human being and you are going about, but that there is spiritual covering all around you. Divine protection all around you. And Joe, I mean, and the devil said, God, I have looked around. I have tried and tried. I can't break through into Job. The devil will not be able to break through into your life. He said, has thou not made an hedge about him and about his house? And about his house. When he said about his house, he's talking about your family. Talking about your spouse. Talking about your children and everybody under your umbrella. And about all that he has. And on every side. Can you hear that? On which side? On the right side? On the left side? In the front? At the back? You are secured. And then... The devil went further. Listen, if you think the devil doesn't know you, you are wasting your time. If you think you can just do something and hide it from man, and you think nobody knows, yeah, man may not see, man may not know, but there is somebody called Mr. Satan that knows everything going on around you. Even when you are whining and complaining, God, why me, why me? He wants you to whine more. He wants you to wind up so you can disbelieve God and break the hedge over your life. You will not break it. Look at something profound that the devil said concerning this man of God. He said, thou hast blessed the work of his hands. And his substance is increasing the land. Listen to this. Somebody here is blessed. Your labor is blessed. Your sweat is blessed. Your health is blessed. Your children are blessed. Your spouse is blessed. The devil said, I know it. I've seen it. I've tried and tried and failed. But you know, at what point did the devil made this revelation? Come back now to verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and the one that feared God and eschewed evil, and hates evil, and separates himself from evil. Can you see from the opening verse? We see the revelation about the man we are talking about. The man of holiness. The man of righteousness. The man of purity. The man that is completely separated from evil and from the world. The, uh, the Bible says that he was perfect and upright. And one that feared God. He feared God. He feared God more than any man. And he has shewed evil. Verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household. So that this man this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. No wonder verse 10, the devil said, the man was blessed. Somebody here will be blessed. Yeah. Verse 4, and his sons went and feasted in their houses, everyone his day, and sent and called for their 
three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so. When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Stop right there. I'll come back. Job is saying, I've not heard of any wrong dream with my children. I have not witnessed or encountered any wrong dream with my children. But paradventure, paradventure, something had happened that I knew not. Job was covering the children. No wonder, no wonder the children were safe and secured. Your children will be secured. And that is why we need to also labor over our children. No matter where they may be, you don't know what they are doing. Pray for them. Make sacrifices for them. Whatever the sacrifice may be on their behalf. Verse 6. Now, this is where we are going. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And read what follow. And Satan came also among them. You wonder why do we see some behaviors and attitudes and characters that are ungodly, unholy in the church? There are some Satans that came to church in Kasok. You know what I mean by Kasok? That is a clergy's attire. They look like us. Maybe they walk like us. Maybe they mimic our talk. They've been around us for so long, but they are agents of darkness. God will deliver us from them. The Bible says that the children of God, they came together. You would have expected that the presence of the Lord should be a holy presence, a pure presence, and nothing sinful. But in the midst of that, this arch enemy of God sneaked in. He also came. He said, God, you created me too. You are our father. Have you not seen people that are smoking and they say, I'm also born again. God is our father. Immoral people, God is our father. I'm robber, God is our father. I even learned that there are some people that at New York, they will go to their pastor to pray for them, and they are 419 people. That the business they are doing so it can work well. They also go to church, and they say it's our father, and the devil showed up, and uh, presented himself, verse 7, and the Lord said unto him, the Lord identified him, the Lord knew him, the Lord knew him. You are not supposed to be here, but you are here anyway, and I know you, and I know your work. Listen, the devil knows, I mean, the Lord knows the works of the devil in your life, and he will stop him. And the Lord said unto Satan, when comest thou? Where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. What is he doing going to and fro? Seeking whom he may devour. It will not be you. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. God knew about Job, about the life of Job, about the consecration of Job, about the commitment of Job, about the sacrifices of Job, about the love of Job for the Lord. And God was testifying to all of those, God will testify for you. And then, verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Stop right there. Does Job fear God for nothing? Can the devil look at you and tell you the only reason why you are serving God is because of the bread and butter? Can the devil look at you and say the only reason why you are serving God is because of the job you have, you have right now? Can the devil look at you and say, the only reason why you are serving God is because you are still expecting this miracle. And once you get the miracle, you are gone. 
And God said, I know Job. Job is not like that. And so, the devil trying to convince God said, now in verse 10, hast thou not made an hedge about him? God said, yes, I know that. I did that. And about his house? And God said, I did that. And about all that he had? On every side? On every side? On every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand? Hallelujah. That sounds like somebody's work being blessed. And his substance is increasing in the land. His substance is increasing in the land. I said all this, you know, I'm still telling you the prep to the message. I've not even gotten to my point one. And I'm still going to end up in point three. Amen? So you can understand the kind of head you have over you. And that you don't take it for granted. With your careless life. You don't take it for granted with, by putting your hand into sin. You don't take it for granted by thinking nobody knows. Nobody, nobody see. Somebody knows. Somebody knows. You know, Moses in his final words of blessing to the children of Israel declared in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 29. He said, happy art thou, O Israel. Who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord? The shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency? And thy enemies shall be found liars unto thee. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. So, even Moses said, the Lord is our shield. He's our rock. He's our fortress. He's our stronghold. He's our power. He's our covering. He's our defense. And look at three things. Number one, the concession of believers' hedge. The concession. The word cause, causes, concession. That is, the reason. What brought about this hedge? This protection over our life that we have, the concession of the believer's hedge. Point number two, the consequences of breaking the hedge. The consequences of breaking the hedge. And point number three, the cure for broken hedge. The cure for broken hedge. Come back to point one. Job, we read it already about this man. And the Bible says in verse 1 that Job was a perfect and upright man and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I told you last week that there is nothing you get from God that is unconditional. Like the eternal security preachers will tell us. God is love. God is good. God is great. Just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Anything you do after that, you are a child of God for life. After that, you go and steal, God still loves you. You go and kill, God still loves you. You commit uh, adultery, God still loves you. You tell a lie, God still loves you. It's a lie of the devil. The Bible said this man was a perfect man. He was an upright man and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed evil. This is what I'm talking about. This conditional love. The love of God is constant. It's always there. It's unchangeable. What you now do, the life you live, is what will determine whether you are a beneficiary of that love or not. And I think I remember, I remember reading to you from Deuteronomy chapter 28, if thou were diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, then those blessings will come. John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, let's say it together, one, two, go. For God so loved the world. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. That means if you don't believe in him, what happened to you? You perish. The love is there. It's constant. But it's conditional upon your own believing and receiving that gift of love from God. The same thing with any and every other thing. So we see the man Job was upright and perfect in the sight of the Lord. The man Job eschewed evil in all his way. The man Job feared the Lord, feared the Lord than any other man. Than any other man. So then, in order for us to be beneficiaries of this hedge, we are talking about, number one, you must be in covenant relationship with God. Covenant relationship, that means you must be born again. You will be saved and free from your sin. Exodus chapter 6 verse 5. And I have also heard the, the, the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Can you see? I have remembered my covenant. Pay attention and look up here, please. The day you gave your life to Christ Jesus, you got into a covenant relationship with God. And that covenant was sealed with the blood of Jesus. And anything that happens from that time going on is going to be conditioned about your life with God and the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The, and then the Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Leviticus chapter 26. We're looking at that word covenant. 26 verse 45. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors. Whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Please, if you miss this, you're going to miss something. The Lord is still speaking concerning the children of Israel. That the children of Israel, he had a covenant with their ancestor. And that covenant he had with their ancestor have to do with them. Covers them. Now, if they do anything wrong, he will deal with them as a father. If they repent on the basis of that covenant, he will forgive them. If you sin on the basis of the covenant of Jesus, through his blood, you receive forgiveness and pardon. Now, what their father did, they will be beneficiaries of it. That tells us that there are some people that their parents have sold them into some idols, some forces of powers of darkness, and that thing also is having effect on their life. Take it or leave it. Some call it generational cause. Listen. This one we are reading is generational blessing. I will be a partaker of that one. As for generational cause, I will not partake in it in Jesus' name. But this is real. And that is why when Nehemiah was praying in the book of Nehemiah, he went back to the memory lane, to history, and said, the sins of our fathers. He dealt with everything. And then he now came to himself and he prayed and the Lord had. You know what we do many times? We believers of today, we don't understand that when you are a little child, you know, some don't understand when we have new children and then we bring them to the church and then we say we do dedication. Unbelievers, they also dedicate to idols. And when they dedicated to idols, they made a covenant. They paid a price. And that thing is there. Now that you are a child of God, pay attention here. You have the power of God. Behold, I give unto you power. To tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means 
hurt you. The power you have right now, you now take that power and then confront all the forces and the powers and the covenant that have been made on your behalf. Or maybe you did it by yourself in ignorance with the power of God you deal with it. If you do nothing with it, it stays there with you. When you gave your life to Christ, you repented of your sin. I told a lie, you repented. I stole money, you repented. I killed somebody, you repented. That has nothing to do with the covenant that was made. You need to now, in this newness of life and the power of God in you, use your new office, position and power in Christ to destroy that yoke. And that is why some believers are still going through some problems in life. Because they assume everything is all right. You will break every ungodly and sensual covenant in Jesus' name. Exodus chapter 2 verse 24. And God had their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham. With Isaac and with Jacob. You see what I'm talking about? These are generations and generations after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have gone away from the Lord. But now that they are returning, God is saying, I am accepting them. Understand, Jesus has not died at this time. But God is saying, I had covenant with Abraham. And on the basis of that covenant I had with Abraham, covenant I had with Isaac, covenant I had with Jacob, I will forgive their iniquity. The same thing happens when it happens on the other way. Covenant. So be sure you get into covenant relationship with God. With God. With God. Then, number two, how can you get into this divine covering? You can get into it by commitment and consecration to God's covenant. You give your life to Christ, you repented of your sin, remain committed to it. Don't follow after the wishy-washy Christianity of today. One say forever saved. That there is nothing like that. They just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Remain committed and consecrated to God's covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 10 says, Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God, and do his commandments and his status, which I command thee this day. The secret of remaining under divine covering is obedience to the laws of the Lord. And the Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that I beseech you, I plead with you, I pray you, bread, therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Number three, have confidence in God and his word. If you must remain under this hedge and you don't want it broken, understand I tell you, whosoever that broke an hedge, the serpent will bite him. The serpent will bite him. So, remain in confidence with God and his word. Psalm 44 verse 6 says, For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. Never you trust on the arm of the flesh. It will fail you. And then Jeremiah of old said in the 17th chapter verse 5, that thus says the Lord, Cause be the man that trusted in man, and make a flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. The man you are trusting in can disappoint you. But God never fails. 
Not that alone you commune with the covenant-keeping God. That is talking about the power of prayer. The Bible says without me you can do nothing. You can do nothing. You can do, that is Jesus speaking. Without me you can do nothing. Pray often, pray always, pray without ceasing. Pray with all prayers and supplication. Pray with fasting if need be. Communing with the Lord. Every day of your life, get instruction and direction from the Lord. Before you step out of your house, before you embark on any business, before you embark on any project, before you get into any admission to any school, make sure you pray. Communing with the Lord. Communing is communicating. As friend to friend, talk with the Lord. Don't look at him as a terrifying person. No. Talk with him like a friend. Not that alone you have communion. Communion with men of like precious faith. Show me your friend and I will tell you who you are. Hebrews 10 25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of, their, of themselves together as the manner of some age. And then you comply. Compliance to the conditions of supernatural covenant. Comply with those conditions. If thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, the blessings will come in Jesus' name. You want to remain under that divine protection? Please don't be a wicked person. Don't be mean-spirited. Care for the needy. Caring for the underprivileged or the disadvantaged or deprived people around you. Remember them. Because the Bible says, whosoever that turns his ears away from the cry of the needy, himself will cry. And yet, without anybody hearing him, you will not cry. And finally, under this point, you ensure that the creative promises of God are embraced from time to time. Creative promises of God. Promises of God. Promises of God. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 5. Uh, we won't read, but you can read that on your own. And then 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 22 says, Touch not my anointing, and do my prophets no harm. If you are under this covering, nothing can touch you. I said nothing can touch you. I said nothing will touch you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. What is the consequence if you don't remain under this covering? What is the consequence if you break this hedge? What is the consequence if you put your hand into sin? What is the consequence if you go out of your way to the enemy's camp? What is the consequence if you take the laws of the Lord for granted, the commandments of the Lord for granted, understand that to be beaten, to be beaten, look at that passage again. Open your Bible there. I want you to now read Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. Because I need to point out some things to you from there. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, what verse? It says, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. A serpent shall bite him. To be beaten by, by a serpent or snake can be very, very deadly. The poison, if not treated, can be lethal. God pulls his hedge of protection around your life. However, if you cause little breaks to appear, little holes through which the enemy of your soul comes in by his cunning craftiness, then when the enemy comes in, when the poison comes in, it fixes his poison fangs on you, sinking into every fabric of your life. Spiritually, physically, materially, matrimonially, it can be very, very destructive and deadly. 
How can you break the hedge? How can you break it? You can break the hedge in your life, over your life, by wrong, ungodly attitude. Ungodly attitude. By simple thoughts. You said nobody, nobody had it, but God had it. As you're thinking in your heart, God had it. By unforgiving spirit. By backsliding. You're putting your hand into sin secretly. By pride. You can break it with pride. God resists the pride, the proud. You can break it through rebellion, disobedience, self-will and stubbornness. You can break the edge through immorality. You can break it by not doing the will of God. Understand the children of Israel in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Stop right there. Are you a sinner enjoying sin, accommodating sin, tolerating sin, toiling with sin, and acting as if nobody knows, nobody sees, and you are still calling yourself a child of God? The Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, that's First John chapter 1 verse 8. It says, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in all. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. Chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 8, now says, he that committed sin is who? Is of the devil. Is of the devil, is of the devil, is of the devil. Verse 9 says, Whosoever that is born of God does not commit sin. Does not commit sin. And so the children of Israel, they realized they had sinned. And then they were looking for deliverance. You will find deliverance. So come back to that Numbers chapter 21. Verses 7 and 8. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. I told you the other time, David came to him and said, he said, I have sinned. He repented of it. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. They said, Moses, we have sinned with our mouth. We spoke against God, and we spoke against you, the servant of the Lord. On the side, I told you, the Bible says, Touch not my anointing, First Chronicles 16, 22. Touch not my anointing, and do my anointed, and do my prophets no harm. And do my prophets no harm. That is exactly what they did, and now problem came. Serpent came, biting them. Many of them were dying. The hedge is broken. Just because of the use of mouth. You know, there are some children that are having trouble because of what they have done to their parents. There are some church members that are having trouble because of what they have done to their pastors or their leader. No matter who that individual may be. It may also, it may also be some wives or their husbands. And yet, the word of the Lord is coming unto us, but the people here, they repented, of course, not until death came into the calm. Not until many of them were already dead. I pray before it is too late, you will turn to the Lord. They say we have sinned, for we are spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord. That, we, that he take away the serpents from us. Whatever that serpent may be. Serpent of infirmity. Serpent of affliction. Serpent of nightmare. Serpent of failure. Serpent of uh, devouring spirit. That he may take the serpent away from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Moses prayed for the people. Somebody here is going to be blessed. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass, that everyone that is beaten, when he look upon it, shall live. You will live. You will live. And so, as it was with the children of Israel, when the hedge was broken, what happened? There was a broken heart. What happened? We're looking at the consequences. There was a broken line. There was a broken family. There was a battered future. There was demonic affliction. There was satanic oppression. There were costly mistakes being made by, by them. They were separated from God. And then separated unto death. Death came in. Spiritual death came in. Physical death came in. Matrimonial death came in. Financial death came in. Social death came in. Look at Saul. When Saul's hedge was broken, he ended up with the witch at end of. That will not be your portion. Can you imagine? He began with the Lord. He began with the Lord. He began with Samuel. He ended up with the witch at end of. He died an untimely death. Look at Sam, Samson, the son of promise, a child of promise. When God was looking for somebody in the land and couldn't find anyone, he sent Samson down. Unfortunately, because of women, Samson lost it. Samson missed it and ended up losing his strength. Samson lost his power. Samson lost his eyes. Samson lost his calling. Samson lost his life at the end of the day in the midst of the enemy. That will not be your portion. In the name of Jesus, look at the man called Solomon. Solomon, the son of David. A man that was told by God, the wisdom you have will be unsurpassed. Unfortunately, the hedge was broken because of women. He did what God said should not be done. And he lost it. You will not lose it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 26. Nehemiah 13 26. The Bible says, Did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. You will not sin. Don't break the hedge of God over your life. As a child of God, as a child of God, I can tell you, the enemy is trying you every day. Every day. Every day. But you will fail. Amen. Eli, the priest from the lineage of the Levites, with the promise of God, after God rejected the firstborn, he peaked on the Levites. Because when Moses said, who is on the Lord's side? They separated themselves. And joined with Moses. And God said, instead of the firstborn, I'll pick on you. I pray God will pick on you. But unfortunately, it got to the time of Eli. The hedge was broken. The hedge was broken. And God was displeased. And God said, have I said? That your lineage will stand before me forever. He said, Now that be far from me. I pray you not be a subject of cause in the name of Jesus. It's good if the enemy is cursing you, it's good if man is cursing you because they will be wasting their time. Who can cause who God has not caused? Let me tell you something. Those of you that are worrying yourself, eh, there is a witch somewhere. There is a wizard somewhere. If the hedge of your life is intact, if it is intact, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. 
So this is a secret. The Bible says, whosoever causes you shall be caused. So I don't have to worry about whoever is causing me. Am I telling you something? Because everything you are dishing out to me, there is a shield. Amen? When you mail a letter to somebody and the postmaster cannot deliver the letter, what would they do? They return to sender. So, the Bible says, whosoever that causes me shall be cursed. But there's another side to it. And I love this side. And that's why I like to pray for everybody around me. Amen? And no matter what you do, I will still pray for you. You know the reason why? The Bible also says that whosoever that blesses me shall be. That simply means, whatever you are doing to me, who are you doing it for? You are doing it for yourself. You are doing it for yourself. You are doing it for yourself. That is why don't be wicked because wickedness goes back to the wicked. The Bible says, look at it, we read it, whosoever that digs a pit shall fall into it. Haman made the gallow. Who ended up in the gallow? Himself. Himself ended up there. Some people, they said, uh, Daniel, because of his faith in the Lord, he must die. He must die. Send him to the den of lion. Who ended up there? Themselves. Whosoever that digs a pit will end up there. This is the word of God. It's not a cause from us. The scripture will be fulfilled. They kindled fire. Ah, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you are not supposed to live. You are good to die. And the Bible says, I will give men for your life. And then the people that carry the, the soldiers, the hefty men, the, the, the strongest of all the military people that carry Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the fire, what happened to them? They were smitten dead by the flame of the fire. But the people that were thrown into the fire, what happened to them? They stood up, you will stand. I said you will stand. They didn't die, you will not die. All the chakus and the chains and the fetters, everything got taken away. Your chains are broken. Your bands are loose. You are free on one condition. Faithfulness to the law. Covenant with God. Covenant with God. If you found that you're in sin, what then do you do? If my people, the Kiona, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. Many of us are proud. We are proud of what we have known that we are not even put into work. If they will humble themselves, and then uh, repent of their evil ways. Many of us, we have sin in our hands and we are praying and we are fasting. Can I tell you one truth? Your prayer and fasting with sin is complicating your situation. It's strengthening the enemy against you. Because you have opened the door for the enemy to come in. If the wall is not cracked, a lizard will not be able to get in. You have allowed the enemy in. Whosoever that break and hedge, I told you, the hedge is like a wall. You broke the wall, and the Bible says, serpent will bite the person. And you are praying in the name of the Lord. And the enemy is using your prayer to walk against you. You will be free. So you repent of it. You confess everything to the Lord. Look at the man called David. David feared no enemy. Be it evil spirit, devil, demon, death, or their agents, their human agents. No mortal man, no mortal man could confront David. That is why David said, 
at that time, David had a good relationship with the Lord. Good relationship. And when he broke the hedge, God came back to David and said, you have killed with sword, and sword will not depart from your house. That's the same God we are serving. He said, sword will not depart from your house. And a lot of evil things happened. But while his life was right with God and the hedge was intact, look at the book of Psalm verse 3. David said, I lay down and slept. And I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. Why was David able to sleep well in the night and wake up well in the morning with new strength? Because the hedge was up around him. The hedge was there all around him. And then he said, But thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. And we know, you know we sing this song? The glory and the litter up of my head. For thou, O Lord, art a shield unto me. He will be our shield. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So then what do you do? To kill, to repair, and to restore the broken head. Number one, part with iniquity. Part with iniquity. Separate yourself from it. How do you part from iniquity? You repent. You renounce it. You return to the Lord. You do your restitution as much as possible. And the Lord will have mercy upon you. Number two, you need the prayer of faith. Prayer of faith. No matter what has happened, you need to believe the Lord. If your repentance is genuine, that God has forgiven you. There are some that God has forgiven, but they have not forgiven yourself, themselves. Tell somebody to forgive yourself. So, your prayer should be prayer of faith. Because Hebrew 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Number three, you put on the whole armor of God. Not some of them, but all of them. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Participate in soul winning. Participate in soul winning. The more you are trying to win the souls of others, the more you are winning your own soul. Persevere in the face of earthly challenges. Perseverance. And then patiently wait for God's appointed time. There is time for everything in life. Wait for God's time. Many are in a haste, running ahead of God. And then the promises of God, make sure you claim them. Isaiah 54 verse 17 says, No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. I said no weapon formed against you will prosper. In the name of Jesus. Do I quickly tell you this? Make sure you pay your vow. Pay your vows. Your vow may not only be in terms of money. It may also include money. Your vow includes your promise to serve the Lord all your life. Are you serving him? Your vow includes your promise to be faithful, to be committed. Your vow includes, Lord, you will be number one in my life. Is he still number one in your life? Is this the number one in your life? That's part of your vow. And then, Lord, give me a job. I will, I will pay my tithe. Are you faithfully paying your tithe? If you will do all this, the blessings of God will come upon your life. Look at yourself. Look at your life. Why are you the way they are? Please pay attention. Even some unbelievers are better than some believers. Why? Because the hedge is broken and our life is even worse than theirs. Worse than this. Because the enemy knows what you stand to benefit if your life is right with God. That's why today we are going to do self-examination. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Lord, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wicked way in me. And then the hedge of my life, this protection. Lord, restore it back. Let us pray.
the hedge over your life. You don't want to be a Christian and live like a pauper. You don't want to be a Christian and still be a slave to sin. The hedge over your life. Brethren, we have had it all. God wants to amend the broken pieces. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord. Let's cry between the porch and the altar and say, Lord, spare thy people, O Lord. In wrath, remember mercy. Cry unto the Lord until he comes and rain righteousness upon us. Break down your fallow ground any form of pride that will not let us go back to Calvary and seek his face until he amend the broken pieces and bring us back to where he wants us to be. Brethren, let's break our